achievement that we should be celebrating and working to replicate. But a number of these bills do just the opposite, making it nearly impossible for our clerks to repeat that success in future elections. Why? Here's some reasons. Senate Bill 285 only allows people to vote by mail if they submit a photocopy of their ID with their application, meaning only those voters who both have access to a copy machine and are willing to open themselves up to the very real risk of identity theft are able to request to vote by mail. This includes senior citizens and military or overseas voters who've been voting by mail under our current secure procedures for decades without problems and would now only be able to do so if they met this new requirement. Yet there's no evidence this change reduces or deters fraud. It actually makes it harder to detect fraud because those seeking to fraudulently request an absentee ballot need only submit a copy of a fake ID to do so, whereas, whereas it's much more difficult to forge a signature. But there's plenty of evidence to indicate that this proposal would limit access for all voters wishing to exercise their state constitutional right to vote absentee. Now, Senate Bill 286 bans the use of drop boxes on election day when, incidentally, they're most typically used, needlessly causing confusion and raising the likelihood of the potential disenfranchisement and rejection of otherwise legal valid votes. Senate Bill 287 bans clerks from prepaying postage on absentee ballot return envelopes, not only eliminating another ease of access provision in the current system and infringing on a local clerk's authority, but also creating a poll tax-like requirement that discriminates against low-income voters. And again, there's no evidence that doing this in any way would increase the integrity of our already secure process. There's more. We already require voters who vote in person on election day to show photo identification to affirm their identity, with a best practice of enabling those who arrive at the polling place without ID to affirm their identity under penalty of perjury with their signature. Senate Bills 303 and 304 ban this practice. Those voters would be required to vote a provisional ballot, which would not be counted unless the voter provides even more documentation than is currently required by law. Senate Bill 311 only allows military service members overseas and not their spouses or dependents to return ballots electronically using their common access card. However, that's not, that's not only problematic because as any service member will tell you, the common access card use is notoriously unreliable, but also the Department of Defense has not agreed to allow the use of the common access card for voting purposes. So in other words, this bill is a lot of talk and no action in part because it's so poorly written as to make both, it, it both potentially unconstitutional and unable to be implemented. Senate Bill 297 requires a canvasser from each party to be present during the county canvas, but with no enforcement mechanism to ensure that they are. So this means that party appointed canvassers would be able to block the certification of an otherwise valid and legitimate election by simply not showing up to the canvas. Senate Bill 296 increases the chances of a canvassing board will fail to certify elections by enlarging them and requiring a supermajority vote to certify. Senate Bill 283 fails to act on the requests that clerks and I have made over two years now to apply ample time of pre-processing for absentee ballots. It only continues to provide 10 hours of pre-processing absentee ballots, which was proposed even though that proved insufficient last year and the national best practice is seven days, and Senate Majority Leader Shirky and former Speaker Chatfield both admitted after last year's election that such that the 10 hour policy was insufficient and that more pre-processing more pre -processing, processing time was needed. It gets worse. Senate Bill 299 would require vote counting to stop and results be reported by noon the day after the election. Let me say that again. This bill would require all tabulation of valid votes to stop by noon on the day after the election and the results reported at that time. Based on the language, it would seem that this needs to occur even if not all the valid votes had been counted by that time. Now, there are 11 other bills in this collection that serve as a deceitful distraction, window dressing, designed to make it look as though the package is somehow making it, quote, easier to vote. But it's not telling eligible citizens that they can pre-register at the age of 16, but then strictly limiting how they can do so is not really allowing for pre-registration of young voters. Allowing for one day of early voting on a Saturday weeks prior to the election, when most voters aren't paying attention, doesn't really provide for early voting in our state. Now this afternoon, I expect senators will also talk at length about bills to maintain the accuracy of the state's voter registration list. 
I completely support transparent, accurate maintenance of the voter list, as I've demonstrated through my actions by carrying out the most extensive list maintenance effort in our state's history. Following federal law, we recently canceled more than 175,000 registrations, and we expect to place many thousands more on the countdown list. We've done this carefully, securely, and much of this was made possible by the absentee ballot application mailing our office conducted last year, which was the first statewide mailing to the list that had occurred in nearly a decade. Yet despite this, the Senate's bill package would ban such a mailing, which increased the accuracy of our voter registration list from ever happening again. Because as I said last week, what's happening behind the scenes is that Michigan legislators are participating in a national coordinated and highly partisan attempt to change the rules of democracy and make it harder for people to vote because they are unhappy with the results of last year's election. Today, we're also releasing graphics that compare the bills in this package to those that were enacted to great criticism in Georgia. We've seen nearly identical legislation also introduced in Florida, Arizona, Iowa, Texas, Montana, and Arkansas. They include legislation to limit drop boxes, restrict the right to vote by mail, and ban proactive distribution of absentee ballot applications and other educational information. To embark on this endeavor is not just un-American and anti-democratic, it's an abdication of the oaths of office these leaders took to serve the people of this state. Because you don't serve the people of this state by silencing their voices. Instead, you embarrass all of us. So what comes next? I and the majority of leaders in various sectors throughout our state will continue to speak the truth to our voters and other leaders about the pernicious realities of this legislation. We're not gonna be silent in light of this attempt to undo the people's will. But we will also continue to provide an alternative path, one that is data-driven, nonpartisan, solution-oriented, and builds on the successes of 2020's elections. I announced my legislative agenda to advance the vote and protect democracy early, earlier this year. It's a nonpartisan package of proposals based on national best practices and the insights of election experts. It furthers the will Michigan voters demonstrated so clearly in 2018 when they voted overwhelmingly to enshrine expanded voting rights in, and options in our state constitution, and again in 2020 when they exercised those expanded rights. Legislators have already introduced numerous bills that align with our positive nonpartisan agenda, but Republican leadership has so far advanced very few of them. So it's my hope that as more and more leaders across the state denounce this poorly drafted, misguided legislative effort, they will change course and instead support legislation that aligns with the will of our state's voters, the principles of democracy, and the values of our nation. Now I'm joined by several key leaders in our state today to underscore the problems with the current proposed legislation and provide the path forward. We'll start with one of the most committed election clerks in our state, Ingham County Clerk Barb Byram. Clerk Byram, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, I'm here today to stand in opposition to this package of bills being offered by, Senate Republic by the Senate Republican Caucus that would strip voting rights away from Michigan citizens. Election administration is not a partisan issue and access to the ballot box should not be either. For months, I attended numerous committee hearings in the State House and State Senate to offer my insight and expertise and experiences of county clerks throughout the state of Michigan. The goal was simple, to educate and inform the legislators of how safe and secure our process already is, and to offer some clear and simple changes that I and the election administrator community believe would improve our process. I attended these hearings in good faith because I believed that the legislators involved actually wish to make sensible process improvements. If these bills are the result of those hearings, then unfortunately they were clearly not listening. Just last week, my colleagues and I from the Michigan Association of County Clerks Legislative Committee voted to oppose the majority of these bills because they do nothing to make our elections any safer or any more secure, but do everything to create hurdles and barriers to the ballot box. The legislation 
will actively suppress voters and make it more difficult for Michigan's residents to exercise their right to vote. A sensible reform would be to offer free and easily accessible identification for voters so that cost is not a barrier to voting. What has been offered, however, are strict ID requirements, including requiring an ID when requesting an absentee ballot, meaning that absentee voters would need to make a photocopy of their license and send that along with the application for the absent voter ballot. Keeping in mind, these voters have already shown their identification previously, whether it was when they first registered to vote or when they voted in person. Owning a home copy machine should not be a barrier to voting. A sensible reform would be to allow clerks flexibility to make it easier to vote by absentee ballot. What these bills do is prohibit clerks from sending absent voter ballot applications, posting a link to sign up for an absentee ballot on their website, and sending ballots with prepaid return postage. A sensible reform would be to give local clerks several days before an election when they could process and tabulate absentee ballots. What has been offered is a continuation of the policy that had us waiting for results for four days after election day. A sensible reform would be to offer clarity and uniformity around how local clerks can implement ballot drop boxes to give voters more options to return their ballots. Rather, what is proposed is videotaping requirements that will make it nearly impossible for jurisdictions to use their ballot drop boxes due to proposed costs and technology barriers. In short, professional election administrators, many of whom are Republicans, have told the legislature ways that they can contribute to make our elections more inclusive, more efficient, and more secure. These bills indicate either a basic misunderstanding of the fundamentals of those suggestions or a willful malicious intent to restrict access to the ballot. I thank you so much for the opportunity. It is my pleasure to introduce Senator Voino. Thank you, Clerk Byram, Madam Secretary. I'm State Senator Paul Voino, and as a former municipal clerk in Warren, I join my colleagues in opposition to these bills. As an elected official myself, I'd first like to state that lawmakers at all levels of government have an obligation to uphold our democratic principles by respecting the freedom to vote and the will of the people and to ensure that every vote is heard. People need to remember that 3.2 million Michiganders voted absentee in the 2020 presidential election out of more than 5.5 million voters. And that was the highest turnout of voting age to cast ballots in over 60 years. We don't need legislation telling us how we should vote, when we can vote, or where we can vote. These bills are an infringement upon our right to vote and by definition are un-American. This bill package does not provide voter protection. It creates voter suppression. I especially have concerns on how the bill package will affect our seniors and people with disabilities. Many of them like to vote in person, but for some, their health doesn't allow them to stand in line for hours, especially during a pandemic. No reason absentee voting lets them vote from home and we need that for them. Some of these bills, will absolutely make it harder to request an absentee ballot application and also harder in the ways in which a ballot can be returned once it's filled out, dictating when drop boxes can be used. Many are physically challenged and are not mobile or do not have access to reliable transportation. Earlier, Madam Secretary referred to Senate Bill 286. If a voter misses the deadline, they will have to hand deliver their ballot at the clerk's office which is extremely busy on election day, presenting the same problems and in-person voting barriers to transportation and risk to physical health. There's also another bill that she referenced in this package, Senate Bill 285, that does make it harder to vote absentee ballot. 
because if a voter requests a ballot by mail, they will have to have a printer with color ink to make a copy of their ID to send to in with their ballot. If they miss that deadline, it has to be delivered in person. There are no provisions in this bill either to say what they do with your photo ID after they copy it and receive it, raising questions about identity theft, which I know is a major concern, not just in Macomb, but across our state. The bottom line is anyone of any age should be able to drop their ballot off when they're ready to turn it in on election day, not by some arbitrary deadlines set by Lansing. To that end, I'm here and ready to work with my colleagues across the aisle and with the Secretary of State to make our democracy the best it can be, because we really do have a great system in our country for elections that we should be really proud of. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Reverend Stephen Bland. Thank you so much, DeWino, and thank you to Secretary Bennett for allowing me this moment to come to stand with many of my colleagues and to address many of you uh, who are citizens, not only of our city and our state of Michigan, but even those who might listen from across these United States concerning something that is very basic to us, and that is our voice is our vote. E pluribus unum out of many one, suggests that no matter who we are and where we are, we ought to be able to express the very basic human right, the very thing that all of us have and should share in common. And that is not only the right to vote, but the ability and the ease of access to vote. After historic voter turnout last year, it is literally shocking and disgraceful that some of our state's elected officials who are here to serve the people would attempt to pass legislation that disenfranchises them. While millions of Michigan voters have made their voices clear, these bills seek to silence them. The people of this state deserve better and we will continue to fight back until we win against this egregious effort that makes it more difficult and less safe to vote. Dr. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said evil cannot permanently organize. It bears within it its own seeds of destruction. Mordecai Johnson said evil is not capable of a perfect plan. As a not only minister of the gospel, but also a black American citizen, all of my life I have watched throughout all of the different generations born in the late 50s and coming up until now, ancestors as well as people who currently yet live and fight back against something that should be our right. I lived to see the 1964 Voting Rights Act that took place and we thought that at that point that this fight would be over. I remember my parents and grandparents and others who breathed a sigh of relief then to believe that we had this opportunity yet to still be fighting this at an age that is beyond some of them. As I look now at my grandchildren and wonder would they have the ease and the right to be able to share in this vote. Voting rights should not be something subject to an act or something subject to changing the pre-clearances and things be changed. Federally, we need to change and we need to bring in the John Lewis Act. We need to be able to make sure it becomes a permanent law. We need to take away the pre-clearances that allow states like Georgia and other states to do this. This is not just a Michigan problem. 43 states all of a sudden have instituted this after this last election. Our president, President Biden said this is similar to Jim Crow 2.0 and I agree. Minimizing access to vote, requiring more ID than it takes to buy a gun, taking away drop boxes in urban communities, stopping souls to the polls of people who will go to ease on Sundays when they have to work six days a week, requiring people to write in and ask for an absentee ballot, and even refusing people who stand in long lines and hours to receive food and water when they are waiting to vote is not only suppressive, it's not only anti-American, but it's anti-Bible. Matthew 25 says, Jesus the master himself said, I was sick and you didn't visit me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was in prison and you didn't visit me. I was hungry and thirsty and you gave me no food or drink. And I don't want it to be said that I stood in a line waiting to cast my vote and you would not even entertain the opportunity nor give me food or drink to do so. When you do it to the least of these, he says, you do it unto me. And so I stand in the legacy of those who have fought 
And just like yesterday, when the verdict came down, finally people who were waiting to gasp for air finally could temporarily breathe free, but we can't breathe long because we gotta continue the fight. We fought for the 15th Amendment that gave you the right to vote to black people, the 19th Amendment that gave the right to vote to women, the 24th Amendment that eliminated the poll tax, the 26th Amendment that dropped the voting age to 18. And here we are in 2021, in the midst of a pandemic, still having to fight. But yes, we will fight because we're determined to win because we know God is on our side, right is on our side, and we will win this fight. Thank you so much for allowing me to stand and declare that righteousness will roll down and justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. It is my joy and my pleasure to be able to say that even as we stood in Lansing, that we stood in this voter suppressive measure and standing with us was the mayor of the city of Detroit. And it is my pleasure to introduce him now as he comes to close us out and share with us his convictions concerning this issue of the right to vote. Receive the Honorable Mayor, Mike Duggan. Well, thank you, Pastor Bland, and thank uh, you to the Secretary of State for putting this group together, because we just need to keep educating and educating. Uh, there's no question why we're here. In November, five and a half million Michigan residents voted, the most in history, most Republican votes in history, most Democratic votes in history. In a normal democracy, any other de Democratic country in the world, we would be celebrating the record turnout as a sign of the health of the democracy. Here in Michigan, the response was alarm. We can't ever have five and a half million people vote uh, again. And this series of bills is designed to do that. And so when you hear uh, the details that the Secretary of State can no longer send out the application in the first place. When you get the application, you've got to copy your, your voter ID before you mail it back in. When you get the ballot, they can't put the stamps on it. They're going to restrict the drop-off locations. And you say, okay, it's a little confusing. That doesn't really sound that bad. And you know what? If you're upper or middle class, it isn't. And I'd like you to think for a minute about two families, and you can understand how reprehensible this is. You're a family that's got a car, that's got a personal computer, has got a printer copier at home. These bills aren't so bad. Uh, you mail in for your application, your application comes in, you fill it out, you take your driver's license out of your pocket, you put it on your copier on your printer, you print a copy, you put it in, you mail it, and when your ballot comes in, you figure out that it takes 71 cents, you go to your computer, you get 71 cents in postage from stamps.com, you print it out, you stick it in the mail. No problem, right? Let's talk about what a poor family has to deal with and what so many of the African-American voters in the city of Detroit have to deal with. 25% of the residents of my community don't have a car and not very many have PCs with printer copiers. So, this is what these bills try to construct. So for a resident of my community who doesn't have that kind of access, they mail in to get their application, application comes. They can't send the application in without a photocopy of their ID, but they don't have any printer copier in their house. They gotta get up to a library or someplace to get a copy. But a quarter of our households don't have a car. Imagine what's gonna happen. You're gonna call your daughter or your neighbor and you're gonna say, can you please drive me up to the library so I can get my voter ID copy and bring it back home just so I can send my application. And when I do send my application in and the ballot comes and now there are stamps on it, I figure out it's 71 cents. I can't print my 71 cents off stamps.com because I don't have a printer to print it on. So I'm gonna to have to get back out, get the postage, I could have taken it up to a drop box, but they put all kinds of restrictions on the drop boxes. Got to go out again, get it in the mail, and I have to do it earlier enough because the postal service in the city is far slower than the suburbs. And now, because the drop boxes are limited, my vote may not be counted. This is what is wrong. They have constructed a series of bills that a poorer family without computers, without a car, has a far harder time voting than the other families. Uh, this is voter suppression at its core. Uh, and, and here is probably the thing that uh, is it, just so disturbing. For 150 years in this state, you could vote by mail on the authority of your signature. You sign an application, it's a crime to fake 
uh, a signature on an application has been enforced when it's been violated, but you can send it in and you've been able to vote that way for 150 years. The same people who are sponsoring these bills just filed 500,000 signatures in the Unlock Michigan petition drive to restrict the governor's powers. Same people. Those 500,000 signatures, they didn't attach 500,000 voter IDs to determine that they were valid. The Secretary of State has just certified those signatures valid, and now they're going to proceed in the initiative process. The, when these sponsors, when it serves their purposes to rely on a signature to get something through, the signature is just fine. But when they see too many people in the city of Detroit, too many people of color who don't vote the way they want voting, now we're going to raise the threshold. It's wrong. I'm very proud of the corporations in the city that have spoken out against it, who actually think everybody should have an equal chance to vote. Uh, and we're going to keep pushing uh, to make sure that people of goodwill in both parties say, this is not what we're about as a state. Uh, and with that, thank you for listening to us, and we'll take any questions. Members of the media, please raise your virtual hands. Uh, we will call on you and you will need to unmute yourself to ask your question. Just a moment, we'll take the first question. Tim Skubik, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Madam Secretary, the popular wisdom in town is, is that even if these bills pass, the governor will veto them. So why are you staging news conference after news conference to fight something that you're going to lose, but eventually win? Shouldn't you be focusing on a counter petition drive to beat what the Republicans want to do through the ballot and the petition drive instead? Thanks, Tim. I, I really like that question because it underscores what my role is as Secretary of State, which is to ensure every voter in the state is educated about their right to vote. As the chief educator of voters in this state, I have a responsibility to ensure, and that's what the release of, of the list of an, our analysis does today, to ensure that every citizen in this state knows what's happening in Lansing right now, knows what's been proposed in Lansing, knows that as they hear about these voter suppression efforts happening in other states as well, they've come to Michigan. And if it does reach a point where any of these proposals are presented to a citizen for a signature and endorsement, it's my responsibility to make sure, as I think everyone is, to, to, that citizens know what they could potentially be signing. So this is an education effort. This is an effort as well in the hopes that legislators will be reasonable and work with us. I would love for Michigan to be in line with states like Kentucky and Virginia and New Jersey, where secretaries of state and governors and legislators have worked together, followed the data, followed the truth, and developed good proposals to improve our elections, because there's always more that we can do together to get there. But these proposals aren't that. And so I'm going to continue, as others have been, to educate others and to raise awareness about just what's being discussed in Lansing right now. And we know that this is really the beginning of this effort, uh, that there may be policies that pass, there may be policies that find, a, find their way to the governor's desk, there may be policies that find their way to uh, 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 other ways to, to voters. And you know, we'll see how that develops. And uh, some of that is really outside of my role as Secretary of State, which is again to focus on protecting our democracy and speaking the truth about what we need, uh, what our voters need, what our voters want to ensure, and what our clerks really have endorsed and called for to ensure that our democracy remains healthy and accessible and secure. So you're really trying to inoculate the electorate against a potential petition drive. Is that a fair conclusion? No, I'm trying to educate everyone and raise awareness about these issues uh, and, uh, across our state and let them know that this is that these proposals, while some of them could even be determined to, to, to be, as I mentioned, uh, somewhat um, cloaked in palatable language, that underneath all of them uh, is a perniciousness that is un-American and anti-democratic. And so this is uh, an effort to ensure that people are aware, that they're educated, and that leaders and those with platforms all throughout the state are aware as well so that they can be informed in using their positions and platforms, as many of the guests who've joined me today have done, to speak out in opposition to this legislation. Craig Mauger, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hey, Secretary, thanks for taking my question. I am curious, do you believe if can the legislature approve all these bills or put them in some type of legislative initiative through the Republican Party 
without violating the constitutional amendment that was approved in 2018. Is that even possible? Well, a couple of things, and, and, and Tim, this gets back to your question as well. You know, there, there's a possibility or a path here, or as I've said already, 4% of the voting age population could endorse changes in our democratic rules and restrictions on the right to vote that affect 96% 96, 96 of the voting age population and, and that, that would uh, likely potentially oppose a lot of those changes. So we have a responsibility to make sure that people are aware of that path, which is at its core, an in incredibly undemocratic, anti-democratic way of promoting policy in this state. All of that said, yes, I do believe that many of the provisions in this package potentially violate uh, numerous constitutional provisions at the state and federal level, not the least of which is the right that citizens have voted to give themselves to have a right to vote absentee. So those types of things will be continued to be discussed as these policies move forward uh, and uh, also will illuminate, as has happened in other states, various pathways to challenging any of these policies that potentially violate the Constitution uh, in future, um, you know, in future moments. Uh, but right now, we're at, we're the moment we're in, and I think it's important to focus on the moment we're in. We have a state legislature and a state Senate that's going to be likely over the next series of weeks debating these bills and hearings. This is the moment where they need to hear from the people of the state, from the leaders of the communities in which they represent about how bad and pernicious these policies would be for the people that they serve. That's our purpose here today. And we'll continue to move forward in affirming that truth in various ways as we need to based on the actions of those who are proposing and promoting these pernicious policies. Jonathan Ostrom, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, uh, Clerk Byram uh, mentioned that some of the new regulations for ballot drop boxes, um, video recordings and so on, um, could be pretty burdensome for clerks. C can you speak a little bit more to that? Do you know what sort of costs might be associated with complying um, with these sorts of proposed regulations? I, Clerk Byram, would you like to, to answer that? And I could supplement if you'd like. Sure, thank you, Madam Secretary. Hi, Jonathan. Some of the requirements for the Dropbox, the video requirements are, are at such a level that even the Senate can't offer that for viewers, for um, citizens in Michigan who want to watch Senate committee or, or Senate session. The requirements are cost prohibitive for many local, local city and township clerks to, to even, uh, to even offer the ballot box. So they have these ballot drop boxes, but this, this requirement will be so cost prohibitive that local clerks won't be able to do that. You have to have access to power, um, which is sometimes difficult, or they may have to bring power out to the drop box from a building. It's cost prohibitive and it's not necessary. Thank you, Clerk. And I'll just add and underscore two things. One, we've just had a successful election in Michigan in which over a thousand drop boxes were securely placed all across the state and it worked well. They were secure. Things went smoothly. There were no problems. There was monitoring, there was security, and there was access. So we know these work. So why add additional requirements that really only have the impact of making it prohibitively expensive or otherwise challenging to place and ensure these drop boxes are available for citizens all around the state. Uh, the, the other thing I'll emphasize is our, we all recognize the importance of protecting the security of the ballot. We just ask that funding and best practices be on the table in making decisions about that. And we've been, um, again, following the data and demonstrating that the clerks have already gotten this right as they have the ability to place drop boxes throughout their jurisdictions. They've done so securely. They've done so with proper monitoring that makes sense for the communities that they represent and addresses the security issues that are already at play. So this is another example of a uh, solution in search of a problem uh, that would really just end up leading to the dismantling or removal of drop boxes as a result of the prohibitive costs and the requirements. Virginia Gordon, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you very much. Um, I'm wondering if one of you could just describe now the process for voter identification for absentee ballots. Um, going back to registration, like there's talk about signature matching, but where does the first signature come from? Uh, 
Great question and very important. The signature protocols we have in place already are effective, secure, and um, and they come into play in multiple ways. When someone registers to vote, they have a signature that aligns with their voter registration. In the vast majority of cases, this is the same signature that that voter may have on their driver's license or state ID. So it's their signature. And then when they request to get a ballot, they again must affirm their identity through signature uh, or through another identifying way to affirm their identity before they even get a ballot. And that, again, that's the second level. That only gets them the ballot. Then once the ballot is returned, it's not counted unless the envelope it's placed in has, has, is signed by the voter and that signature matches the other signatures that are on file. So again, there's multiple uh, steps, multiple protocols, and these protocols have worked in two ways. One, they they prevent or deter fraud, but they also enable us to uh, efficiently validate ballots, which when you're talking about thousands and millions is important to do. And then finally, they've proven effective at, at identifying times when there is a mismatch and when clerks may be needing to confirm a voter's identity in another way, oftentimes by reaching out. So there's again, multiple protections in place to affirm the identity of the voter at every step of the process. And that's why an additional cumbersome identity not only would be ineffective, not only would be costly, not only would be burdensome, not only would, would cre create an opportunity for identity theft, it's not needed. Zach Gorchow, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, good morning, Secretary Benson. I I'm wondering what is the specific concern with the provisional ballot? that it's another step in a process that could deter someone from participating. In this case, and, and, and I, I think what you're talking about is the use of the provisional ballot in a scenario where there's stricter ID requirements, a voter shows up without a photo ID, instead of doing what they can do now, which is again, the national best practice, which is use their signature to identify themselves by signing an affidavit and that signature is later used to affirm their identity. Instead of that, they would have to cast a provisional ballot and provide additional forms of identification or in order to affirm their identity. This is another example of, of something that enables a, propo a proposer, a uh, legislator to say, look, we're doing more to protect the security of the elections, we're protecting the integrity of the process, but there's no evidence that this is necessary. Uh, there's no evidence that the current system hasn't been been working efficiently and effectively, uh, but there's plenty of evidence that this would require additional burdens that would deter someone from participating and you know, likely in this scenario, lead them to leave a precinct without voting, as opposed to having to go through an additionally cumbersome effort or cast a provisional ballot and then because of whatever reason, fail to meet the additional identification requirements required under this new proposal. So again, it's an example of an impact that's primarily going to be disenfranchisement when there's really no advancement of the integrity principle, either in this proposal uh, or a need for it, given our current protections. We have two more reporters that haven't gotten to ask a question. We'll take those last two questions before we close out. Uh, Dave Boucher, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, Secretary Benson. Thanks for taking my question. Can you talk a little bit about um, Senate Bill 308? It's a, a bill that would establish a, a signature verification process. It's, it, it seems to be standardizing how signatures would be verified, which seems to be a, a difficult process anyway. Why, why is that a bad thing, in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's important to have uh, guidelines and clarity that every clerk follows when evaluating signature verification. Uh, this particular bill requires overly specific and re restrictive signature verification that could lead to the rejection of an otherwise valid signature. Right now, we have provisions in place both to evaluate the signatures and to require clerks to follow up with uh, with voters if there's any uh, concern or any uh, question about the signature match. That system has worked just fine. Additional requirements or overly restrictive matching requirements could potentially lead for voters who are otherwise valid voters to wrongly have their ballot rejected. Sam Dodge with MLive, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks, Secretary. Um, I, I'm asking about um, the, the Senate Elections Committee is introducing a lot of, uh, is talking about the bill starting today, 
And a lot of the stuff is about managing the qualified voter file, uh, requiring training reports. Some of the bills that seem less embattled um, and less controversial. Um, do you do you differentiate between some of these bills that are like that and a lot of the controls on the absentee ballot process and your opposition to the package? Right. Yeah. I I have I do know that in today's Senate hearing uh, there will be a number of Senate bills that have been passed to the House and a number uh, that have that our office has already expressed small concerns about uh, in particular or, or and some that that um, are. Um, seem to be calling on us to do something that we're already doing. Uh, and so a lot of it seems like a lot of window dressing. A lot of it also, in my view, seems like a way to say, look, we're being very reasonable here in promoting these policies and discussing these policies today uh, that, uh, you know, that, that, that the secretary has agreed on in the past. All of that is fine as well, but it shouldn't be used to distract or cover up the fact that the vast majority of bills in the 39 pack bill package that we've been discussing today and that our analysis goes into are a pernicious, pernicious effort to undermine our voters' will and make our democracy less accessible and in, in that way and in, in many ways, in my view, less secure. Uh, and, and that's why I also mentioned the work we've already done and are doing uh, to ensure our voter registration lists are accurate. Uh, that work will continue, uh, as I mentioned, and we, really welcome the legislature's collaboration on that as opposed to proposing things that make it or would make it appear as though they're mandating some sort of uh, list maintenance requirements that we're already doing uh, as a way really I think of 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 contributing to a narrative uh, uh, that that is a false one uh, that there's um, you know reasonable legislation when in reality it's the vast majority of these bills as I mentioned are very problematic uh, and, and deeply troubling. Thank you folks, we're at time. So we're gonna call it for today, but we appreciate you all tuning in and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone.